my brain is split in two. I can't really understand how I'm feeling a lot of the time, can't really categorize it. I could see I was acting and thinking differently, but I didn't feel different. And so I categorized each of these, these personalities as colors. Just use the strategies when you feel stressed. How do you know if you're elixophimic? It kind of makes you lose faith in the whole process. How do you work through something which is impacting you emotionally if you're not aware of what emotion you're feeling? You can recall something that's really difficult, something that's really caused an impact on your life, but you don't necessarily feel the accompanying emotions. This is what I deem the blanket method. Other than feeling that emotion, there are three areas of change. Good day and welcome back to the Thomas Henley YouTube channel with your host, of course, Mr. Thomas Henley, and today we're going to be talking about unraveling autistic alexify me if you haven't been here before on the channel welcome or if you have welcome back i do want to share a little bit of a story about my own personal experiences because alexify me is something that probably out of all the autism concepts made the most positive impact on my life in both understanding myself and progressing in life. I was diagnosed at the ripe old age of 10 years old with autism, and throughout primary school I was generally quite a bubbly kid. Once I started to get a little bit older in primary school, I started to realise that was something quite different about me compared to your average person. I felt very disconnected from the other kids, I didn't feel like they understood me when I was trying to communicate. But I also I didn't understand what they were trying to communicate. There was a lot of social norms, social things that were sort of developing amongst my peers, and I just wasn't catching up. When I went to secondary school, the environment was a lot different. It became a lot more intense, a lot more sensory provoking. There's a lot of people, it was a very busy place, very noisy place. And when mixed in aspects of the social world that I wasn't really aware of and I couldn't really integrate myself into properly, it brought a lot of anxiety with it too, alongside some other notable things. Number one being my experiences with isolation. I think this is something that a lot of autistic people experience going through the school system, especially in high school, secondary school kind of ages. I felt like I was a little bit of a wallflower, or I didn't really fit in anywhere. Over time, I collected myself a bunch of different... I, I accrued over time a fair amount of unfavourable individuals bullies. On the way to school, I was pretty much harassed quite considerably by one of the younger years kids. I was fairly, uh, even at that point, I was a fairly tall person, but it didn't really have much of an impact because I wasn't really effectively able to self-advocate for myself in confrontational situations like that. I didn't really know what to do. I also experienced bullying interpersonally. I had a lot of sort of social shaming, people gossiping and stuff about me and saying all sorts of things and alongside the typical old physical bullying. But a lot of these things, they all caused me a great deal of anxiety. I felt this intense feeling of paranoia pretty much any time of my day because the bullying was so inconsistent and I didn't really understand the the pointers, the um, signs of someone potentially becoming a, a bully of mine, I didn't self-advocate for myself soon enough. And it also left me with a sense of uncertainty, like I couldn't, I didn't know it could, could happen at any time. That long-term anxiety, that social paranoia, that sort of isolation, those instances of bullying, eventually caused me to become a little bit, how do you say, not looking forward to the future. Um, I felt helpless. That feeling of learnt helplessness was just sort of embedded with me and it just started to grow and grow and grow. It manifested in different ways and if you know much about the concepts of dissociation, uh, dissociation is something that is kind of a, a natural sort of primal response to someone who's going through difficult things. It's your brain's way of sort of psychologically detaching from events which are causing you a lot of stress or a lot of pain. Sometimes, especially when it's related to long-term mental health conditions, that can persist. Led me to feel very detached from the world. I developed a pretty intense addiction to sugar. And when I say addiction to sugar, I don't mean just, you know, I can't help myself, but I have a little flapjack now and again, you know, a little donut, there's a little chucky biscuit that's on the side. I would basically medicate myself when I was feeling anxious, eating, drinking lots and lots and lots and lots of sugar to experience the sugar crash that came from it. That sort of insulin spike. I found that to be quite relaxing, digging me a stomach ache, made me feel sick, had all sorts of GI consequences, but that's how I coped with it as a very young person. And I engaged in a lot of self-harming behaviours, which I'm not going to go 
too much into, you can probably imagine where that comes from. This whole thing, I mean, I was taken into psychotherapy counselling once people realised I was harming myself, and they put me on a lot of psychiatric drugs. SSRIs. And that had some, some strange consequences, it sort of flattened my mood a little bit, made the, the highs a bit lower, made the lows a bit higher. Helped me cope with those intense feelings that I was having to a certain degree. Not a good time. Not a good time in my life. I did a lot of introspection, sort of looking at myself, trying to understand myself. Because although I was diagnosed autistic and a lot of autistic people report feeling like an alien, I didn't feel like the autism, as, as what I understood it as, as being the sensory and social aspects, being quite hard for me. Being related to this feeling of disconnection that I had with my emotional brain. I would quite often feel like, and I even made a video on this probably like a few few years ago, where I sort of did an essay on like how I feel like my brain is split in two. Like my logical brain is very different to my emotional brain. There's not very many connections between the two. I can't really understand how I'm feeling a lot of the time, can't really categorize it. And that's been something that's been pretty prevalent in my life as far as I can remember. The way that my young brain characterized this feeling of sort of distance from my emotions was as colours, as as personality types, because as you know, emotions impact the way that you behave, the way that you look and the way that you perceive and think about things. But for me, because I couldn't tell what I was feeling, all I noticed was changes in my personality, you know? Blue, probably related to sadness, red probably related to anger, black probably related to some feeling of numbness or depression. And that's basically how I understood myself as an entity and for a long time I thought, you know, I, I don't really show the clinical signs of dissociative identity disorder, but I kind of feel like it, it just fits in a way to, to how I'm sort of conceptualizing what I am and how I work. And that's basically where I was for a large portion of my life and I've been trying to think about all the reasons to why I feel like, feel this way. And it was only until probably a few years ago, then I came across the idea of alexithymia. I do want to point out, I'm not a registered psychotherapist, so a lot of what I'm going to be talking about in the concepts of, sort of the context of alexithymia is going to be from my own experiences and my own ways of understanding the, the experience of alexithymia. Basically, it's a difficulty both noticing and categorizing one's emotions. So noticing it, being able to tell you're feeling angry perhaps, or categorizing it. Knowing that somewhat your emotional state's changed, but not really sure in what exact way. The important thing to highlight here, for anybody who still believes the whole autistic people don't have emotions or empathy myth, I still experience emotions and they still impact my behavior, my thoughts, and my body, my physiological bodily response to emotion. And in my mind, it's best viewed as a threshold condition. If you can see right at the bottom of this little presentation thing that I've got going on, you'll be able to see some lines. And I'm going to use this, this graph to explain a lot of the different concepts in my life related to alexithymia and sort of give some kind of graphical description of what it might be like in, in order to make it a little bit more consumable. Each of these lines, these dotted lines, are awarenesses so for me, as an autistic person with alexithymia, my awareness is, you know, my awareness threshold is pretty high. So I need a high degree of emotion in order to tell that I'm feeling it and in order to characterize it. Whereas for most people, it might look a bit lower. And again, I'm not going to put, be really anal about like the numbers that we're putting on and percentages and all that, because obviously it's going to vary a lot person to person. But let's go on to the first thing. Why are we alexithymic? So in autistic people, the rates of alexithymia is much, much higher. I'm not going to go into the specifics about the percentages because there's not been that much research done on it and the percentages tend to vary a lot when it comes to autism studies, but it's pretty high. The interesting thing is that it's also caused by trauma. PTSD. Complex PTSD. Kind of makes you think, you know, is this something which is inherent to the experiences of autistic people? Or is it created from our own experiences? Because autistic people are indeed disproportionately affected by a lot of negative life experiences alongside a lot of mental illness. Kind of makes you think, and it's something that I'm still trying to understand, trying to find some information about. But for me, as far back as I can remember, I've been alexithymic. You may have heard of the Myers-Briggs test. 
that sort of 16 personalities thing. You know, I'm not going to go into like the legitimacy of it or anything, but when I was younger, I took that test and I was given the thinker archetype because ever since I was very young, I've been very much the more logical type of person. I used to think that logic was superior to emotions and that emotions were just these annoying, niggly, like impacting things on my life that I wanted to get rid of. And emotions were a lot more unpredictable, a lot more grey, a lot more subjective. And so it was quite hard for me to wrap around, wrap my head around exactly like what these emotions are and try to understand them properly. So let's go into the idea of me having coloured personalities. What exactly was going on there? Why is this something that I experienced, this weird characterization of who I am as a person as having these different personalities that just kind of impose themselves on me at different parts of the day. You can imagine sort of the left hand side, that being my baseline, along the way of getting perhaps very angry and irritated, I may get to a point at which I would consider myself to have a red personality because my behavior is changing, the way that I'm interacting with people is changing, I'm looking a bit more moody, I'm a bit more withdrawn, I'm a bit more short and direct and blunt. My thoughts are circling around something which I don't particularly like that someone did. So I would characterize myself as being a red personality, but I wasn't particularly at the point of feeling the, the anger. People would often be able to tell I was angry or upset way before I was able to actually tell, tell that I was angry. And usually that would anger me more and sort of push me over the edge so that I could actually tell that I was angry. It's like, oh, you, you seem angry. It's like, I'm not angry. So I'm, I'm angry now, you know. <laughs> I could see I was acting and thinking differently, but I didn't feel different. What about my sort of behaviours, the things I did? Because one of the, the main things that I used to do as a young autistic kid was listen to very emotional, sad music. As you can see, that sort of orange line that I have at the top is my awareness, my emotional awareness. For a lot of people, they might be able to tell a little bit lower down that they are feeling sad. I need to listen to something which kind of amplifies my feelings enough so that I could notice them. Quite often I've had a difficulty with expressing emotion and expressing sadness. I think probably as a result of medication and also a result of depression, primarily a result of alexithymia. So you can imagine this red line is sort of B, feeling sad. I'm pretty sad, like I'm going over that kind of 50% sort of number. Uh, I'm not feeling the best, I'm feeling like a little bit glum. But I don't notice that I am, it's just expressing in my behaviour. Generally, like the best way to process sadness is to let it out, is to cry, is to get upset. Because after you get upset, and you, you think about it while you're upset. Your brain sort of processes the emotions. You, you feel a little bit better after you've done so. For me, with that sort of blue line, I would listen to sad music, which would kind of tip me over the edge and make me cry and make me get upset. And it kind of feels like a very strange thing to do to want to feel sadness. But due to my experiences with alexithymia, it can sometimes feel like I'm just not reacting in the way that other people do to things that should make me feel sad. and sort of let that let, let that sadness out in a cathartic way. And it also comes in the, the other flavour, sort of talking about happiness as well. So at the bottom, the bottom graph is me talking about my experiences with like medication. You know, perhaps I might have a good day. And that line, that line of happiness or, you know, in, in, endogenous endorphins, if you want to call them, or contentness or bliss or excitement props over that line and allows me to feel happy and I can say at the end of the day I had a really great day. However, taking medication, as I said before, really flattens my mood profile down even more. It reduces the level of happiness I'm able to feel. Not too much that most people might be able to feel that they're happy, but for me, didn't really cross that line. I couldn't really tell. But let's talk about something which I think is the, the pivotal, kind of more impactful way that alexithymia can impact my life, particularly during those ages, was psychotherapy. As you can imagine, some of the ta the talking tactics that people might use to sort of bring this, this, this emotion, bring this experience out of you, it doesn't particularly work that well because you can recall it, you can recall something that's really difficult, something that's, that's bothered you, 
something that's really caused an impact on your life, but you don't necessarily feel the accompanying emotions. And so you can process it logically, but not really emotionally. Pretty much the entire time that I went through psychotherapy as a kid, I didn't cry at all. I just didn't open up. I didn't express. So let's go down three typical paths that psychologists might take when talking to you about mental health. Tell me about this. So I explained something deeply saddening, deeply impactful on my life. And I'm just normal like this, just chatting. And they ask me, how do I feel? And I say, I'm not sure. Kind of shuts down the conversation there, doesn't it? Because how do you work through something which is impacting you emotionally if you're not aware of what emotion you're feeling? <laughs> you can't actually like feel the emotion or tie the emotion to a specific event that's happened. It's quite quite hard to sort of process those deep-seated feelings from events that have happened if you can't feel it. Number two, you experience three general bad things this week. The psychotherapist might ask you, why do you look so sad? Your response would be, as an alexithymic individual, I just feel sad for no reason. I don't know why I feel sad. Most people might be able to make that connection from the resulting feelings from these bad experiences and go, this is the cause of me feeling bad this week. But for me, because I didn't link those, I didn't feel that emotion enough during that time, and I didn't link it to an event that's happened, I don't log it as something considerable on impacting my mood. So I respond with not sure, really. Another situation here, you have a bad experience, you don't log that emotion. Someone asks you, how did that make you feel? And you say, I don't know. I don't know how that made me feel. Kind of shuts down a lot of conversations, makes psychotherapy, counselling quite difficult if someone is that heavily alexithymic that you can't connect emotions to events and you cannot feel the emotions from recalling said events. But let's have a look at sort of strategies because there's a lot of stuff out there which you know, is around autism and sort of regulating emotions. We tend to have meltdowns and shutdowns and, and panic attacks, which can really get in the way of overall functioning and living, living, living. <laughs> so let's have a look at this, this graph. Okay. So the psychologist might say to you, they might give you a sheet, breathing exercises, actions that you can do to do when you feel your anxiety is high, when you feel anxious. So for most people, you can see sort of with that pink line, you've got NT there, which stands for neurotypical, basically someone not alexithymic in this case. They'd be able to tell when their anxiety goes up, say, oh, oh, actually I'm feeling anxious. So they implement the strategy. Goes down, goes back up, they implement the strategy, goes back down, etc. So it kind of works for them. For me, for an alexithymic individual, it would be more along the lines of, okay, I don't know, I'm maybe I feel different, I'm not, I'm not too sure, and it just kind of goes on like that, to the point where I am able to tell that I'm anxious. But the problem there, when I feel this, and I can characterize this as being anxiety, I'm already, I'm already on my way to like having a meltdown, having a shutdown, just having a very strong emotional response. And so trying to break away from that intense feeling to do something, something like a breathing exercise is, something like that, it's not always going to work very well. And in fact, most situations, it kind of makes you lose faith in the whole process. So people will say like, just use the strategies when you feel stressed. Keywords there, you feel stressed. How do you know if you're alexithymic? That's the problem. Just breathe when you feel stressed. Ah, okay, great. Um, I can't really breathe because I'm hyperventilating, you know, at this moment. Just take breaks when you feel stress. Okay, I'm going to go throughout the whole day just working until I feel stressed, which just gets to a point where, again, I have a panic attack, I have a meltdown. Anxiety rises to a point which I need someone else's support to help me lower my anxiety to get to a more comfortable, less anxious place. Not very helpful. Let's go into a little bit more about why the strategies might not work. Can imagine the pink line. It's kind of the NT experience. As a, as again, you can see sort of the the emotional awareness thresholds that one might experience. Trying to implement these strategies is quite difficult because every time that I try to implement them, it's too late. So I go up, my anxiety becomes at a point where I'm aware and it's way too much. I have a meltdown and then it drops all the way back down. And maybe the next time I might be able to catch it in time 
do those exercises, calm myself down. But it's not consistent. Whereas for the person who isn't alexithymic, they'd be able to tell. They'd be able to do it in time and keep themselves at a manageable level of anxiety. These darn stupid, useless breathing exercises. <laughs> My God, I didn't see any, any benefits at all from doing these breathing exercises. I found that, you know, when I did them, perhaps I didn't have meltdowns, but I didn't really feel any different. And the reason for that is due to my, like, my emotional awareness. It was just a bit higher. If I have intervals or plans, breaks where I breathe and I, I sort of regulate myself through breathing, I wouldn't really be able to tell that I was anxious in the first place and not be able to tell really what the effect of that breathing exercise was because it was so minute. Even though it was helping me and sort of keeping me level, I wasn't aware of it. It was just this constant thing. Whereas for most people, they'd be able to tell when they're getting a, bit, like, a little bit anxious and how the breathing exercises reduce it to a point where they feel okay. This thought came back to me on one of the streams that we did. We did the Wim Hof breathing method, uh, which is basically a more intense version of anxiety reducing breathing exercises. You breathe really, really quickly, hyperventilating to increase your adrenaline, increase your cortisol, your activate your sympathetic, your, your fight and flight nervous system to a point where you feel quite panicked and you feel quite anxious. But then you do strategies to reduce it and you hold your breath. By going through different cycles of doing this, you end up feeling a lot more chilled, a lot more relaxed than you were when you started. Now I could tell that had an impact on me because it was intense. So if you can imagine this, this blue graph at the bottom, the spikes would be way up. So my anxiety, it would rise my anxiety all the way up to a point where I could tell it was there and then drop it down to a considerable amount and then rise it back up and drop it down even more and then drop it down even more on the last one. And so I could actually tell and I was thinking to myself, okay, so breathing exercises do work because this is just an extreme version of regular old breathing exercises. So if you are finding that you don't really see much change from doing breathing exercises, it definitely does. It's a scientific proven fact. It definitely does help you. It just might not be as noticeable to you than to most people. But I've talked a lot about the difficulties of alexithymia and the ways that it can impact us. Let's talk about two ways that I found that have been useful for me managing my stress, my anxiety, my emotions throughout the day. This is what I deem the blanket method, which basically consists of things that you do daily that reduce anxiety or at intervals throughout the day. So for example, you can see sort of at the, the bottom, that sort of yellow strip, you have sensory supports, allowing yourself to stim, really important one, having a stable, healthy diet, not too many sh sugars to sort of spike your blood sugar up and down, having a sense of routine and sensitivity to certainty to each each part of your day. Generally, all of this stuff has a, has a good positive effect on me and it might for you too, but there can also be these sort of intervals that, that we can do that could be things related to having daily exercise. For me, the gym, massively important. And in an ideal world, I would probably get myself a massage, you know, and then have a planned break at the end of the day to regulate, to be in a, a space and listen to music and de-stress, de-anxiety de from, you know, the, the stresses of the day that's just happened. And although I can't really tell if it's having an impact on me, it doesn't really make much difference because I'm not getting to the point where I'm having panic attacks and meltdowns. So it definitely has to be viewed if you're using these blanket methods consistently over time. And you've got to monitor like, am I getting to points where I'm too overwhelmed, where I'm too stressed? Am I getting to those points less often than I, than I used to? If so, you're probably doing something right. Basically, this whole thing, this whole idea of a blanket method is that it helps reduce your anxiety and stress through planned activities, supports, and lifestyle changes. And these, for me, have definitely been extremely, extremely helpful. The only problem with this approach is that it doesn't always help in extreme situations or novel situations. New places, new things that you're going to do, new activities, new changes to your life. Doesn't always help with that. But let's talk about the other side of things, which is the more complex one. 
but does have a lot of utility for those extreme and novel situations. And this is something that I've been working on myself for a long time, trying to understand. This is what I deem alexithymic awareness. Emotional awareness, you could probably, it's probably the same, probably makes a bit more sense, but. So let's give the example of anxiety just to give some semblance of like applicability to how this might work. Basically for me, other than feeling that emotion, there are three areas of change that happen to me when I'm feeling any said emotion. Bodily signs, behavior changes noticed by both myself and other people, and also thought distortions, thought changes. What am I thinking about? Where am I focusing, etc. I can usually tell that I'm anxious when my legs start to hurt, when they feel uncomfortable, like there's ants crawling on their bones, when they feel tense. You might be able to notice if you've got like a Fitbit, you know, heart rate monitor, or, you know, you take your own heart rate, you might be able to notice that your heart rate is, is higher than usual. That might be another indicator. Also gut issues. You find a lot of issues related to your GI tracts. I'm not going to go too much into that. You know what I mean? Ticks. Uh, I get physical ticks, similar to what people might see as like Tourette syndrome, but I'm not diagnosed with Tourette syndrome because it's not consistent enough, and I don't have enough ticks for it to be considered that. So I haven't gone for it. And also the amount of stimming that I'm doing, the unconscious stimming that I would be doing during the day. It's not really something that I can isolate myself, but it might be helpful for you. For more complex emotions related to anger, there's not really that many things related to the body other than muscle tension and perhaps feelings of like redness in my face or something. But this could be things related to like how you look on the outside. Like are you, are you starting to make a lot more sort of angry faces? You might not be able to notice, but other people might be able to. So if they tell you you look angry, it might be worth just logging it in your in your brain maybe not giving them the time of day with it but if you don't want to there's feelings of pda i know like when people tell you you are something that you don't feel i understand that could also be related to like your body language are you facing away from people are you moving away from people are you engaging with people less are you being more quiet are you being louder are you isolating yourself off experiencing reductions or increases in your own self-esteem? Do you change the subject to different things, which you wouldn't usually talk to, talk about very much? You know, I might find that if I'm quite angry, I might talk about Taekwondo more or martial arts or going to the gym because I want to get that energy out. And also like the words, the choice of words that you use could be something very subtle. And the last thing is the thought changes, which no, sadly, other people can't give you much input on. But this could be along the lines of your beliefs and opinions. Your beliefs and opinions might change considerably one moment to another. If you're feeling quite anxious, you might turn from sort of feeling very connected and like people are friends with you to people are not friends with me and people are just treating me this way and they're, they're making fun of me and I'm experiencing all this paranoia. That might be another thing. Could be along the lines of perception as well. Perhaps, you know, if you feel a bit more anxious, you tend to be a lot more sort of wired in, perhaps a bit more dissociated. Related to the style of thinking that you have, are you being a lot more straightforward and blunt in your thinking, or are you sort of daydreaming and thinking about lots of things? The speed or order of your thoughts from very anxious, the speed of my thoughts increases and it becomes gradually more disordered to the point where it just feels like my brain is just chucking different ideas and concepts and thoughts at me. Could also be something related to your gut reaction. For example, someone approaching you when you're angry, uh, your gut reaction might, might in, in most cases be to smile and say, hello, how are you doing? But perhaps your gut reaction this time is to be like, oh God, I don't want to talk to them. Your motivation, of course, your motivation to do things if you're in a particularly negative state of mind. Your motivation might be reduced. If you're feeling quite on top of the world, a bit more excitable, a bit more energetic, it might be a bit higher. And lastly, your alertness. So are you quite dull to your environments? Are you quite like stable? The sensory stuff and the social stuff isn't getting to you as much. You might be a bit calmer. But if you do find yourself like really hyper vigilant and sort of tracking everything that's going on and nitpicking on, on and isolating different details of different social interactions and environmental changes, then perhaps you might be a little bit more excitable or anxious. These are all things to really consider when you're trying to improve your emotional awareness. And it's not the easiest thing to do. But what can this look like? If we take the example of our usual level of emotional 
awareness or alexithymic awareness uh, being the red line. Perhaps with logging these physical, behavioral and thought things over a long period of time and really embedding them in our way of sort of monitoring our own emotional state, we reduce that line by just a tad. And so throughout the day, you know, when we're thinking, do we need to breathe? You know, perhaps the first time I might be like, no, we don't need to breathe. I don't feel very anxious. And the second one, usually, you'd probably still not be able to tell that you're anxious or you're getting increasing your anxiety. And so you don't breathe again. You don't do those techniques, those exercises to calm yourself down. And then you get to a point where it gets too much and you have a meltdown and everything goes wrong. Perhaps if you increase that or, or reduce that threshold for telling how you're feeling through these different physical behavior and thought based things. The next time you ask yourself, do I need to breathe on this on the second time, you might be like, oh, actually, maybe I do need to. I'm noticing my heart rates a bit up. I'm feeling a bit like sweaty. My hands are a bit clammy. I'm thinking I'm worrying a lot about things. I'm you know, in my head. I'm sort of withdrawing a lot socially in this context. Maybe I do need to to, to breathe and keep myself out of this and then you go on to the next one and then you notice your anxiety has risen again and you're like okay I need to breathe I need to regulate I'd say that this has a lot more impact on me in those extreme novel situations and for a lot of people maintaining these sort of blanket methods might not be as easy it might be a bit inconsistent I know that specifically for me when my mental health gets bad when I need them the most my executive function drops and sometimes I don't upkeep the things that would generally keep my anxiety to a minimal level if you are going to sort of sort of get, get a bit more of a grasp on your emotional regulation really consider both of these consider the blanket methods that I've talked about Consider trying to get to get a bit of a, a self profile of your own signs, your own thoughts, your own behaviors, your own bodily signs might allow you to do things outside of your routine that you wouldn't usually be able to do because you already have those inbuilt sort of ways of noticing if you're getting a bit too overstimulated. This is particularly quite important for me when I was traveling. I was backpacking around with a backpack of course around southeast asia for about two weeks for a month rather two months i think actually <laughs> and we were never in the same place for more than three days and there's a lot of change in that and there's not a lot of consistency is not a routine i can't always exercise and so i really needed to rely on myself to notice if i wasn't feeling good and to take a break so if this has helped you please make sure to like, subscribe. And if you want me to continue making more of these instructional videos, consider becoming a member. My memberships are only 99p. That's as low as I could put it. You get a lot of cool things. You get some neurodiversity badges. You get some emojis. You get access to my uncut live streams. And of course, like, I'd highly recommend going down in the description, checking out my links, my stuff. I've got an Instagram page that I do a lot of stuff on. Uh, I've got a podcast, of course, which you can also view on YouTube. Let me know. Has this helped you? Down in the description, description, down in the comments. Did you know about Alexithymia? Does this help explain like a massive part of your life as it did to me? I'd really love to hear. If I'm live at the moment, come join me. Say hi. I'm a very friendly person and I would love to have you on the stream. But anyway, I will stop rambling and I'll let you go on with your day. See you later.